So before we start talking about the tails themselves, we first have to talk a little bit about the feudal system. So the feudal system was how society ran during Chaucer's time. And in the Canterbury Tales, that system is both upheld and kind of poked at and broken down a little bit. There are five classes in the feudal system. First is the ruling class, and that's the nobility, the knights, all that jazz, and obviously they're in charge. Then we have the clergy, and those are the people of the church. And remember how I said that they are also the people who are in charge of education. Then we have the middle class, and the middle class is not nobility, they weren't born into money, but they also aren't the merchants and the tradespeople. So they're kind of this middle ground. And they're also growing during this time period. Then we have a trade class. So these people work with their hands, but they're actually very highly skilled workers. Um, so they're trained at a specific job like cooking or weaving or tapestry making, things like that. Then we have the peasant class. And these are kind of like the unskilled laborers. They're plowmen, sailors, people who work outdoors. Now, the Canterbury Tales is what's called a framework narrative. Basically what that means is that you have one guy telling a large story that has lots of little stories in it. However, this is unfinished. There were supposed to be 120 tales altogether. Each pilgrim was supposed to tell two on the way out and two on the way back. But before he could finish, Chaucer only did 22 and then he died. So the narrator is Chaucer. Um, he is unreliable and says that he's naive and sociable, but the hosts describe him quite differently. All of the descriptions that follow are descriptions from his point of view. So you have to remember that they're colored by his personal prejudices. And really, that's something you need to evaluate when you're reading anything. You have to ask yourself, is my narrator actually reliable? So the knight is in the first group or the ruling class. This makes sense because he is also the first person to tell his tale. This guy has been in like 15 crusades and is presented as being brave and basically everything you would imagine a knight should be. The squire is actually the son of the knight. He contrasts his dad a bit because his dad's all honorable and everything and uh, the squire is all about some dancing and some flirting around. So he is all about that ruling class life. With the prioress, we move into the clergy class. So her job would be to take care of a nunnery and all the nuns that lived there. Uh, she's described as being charitable and compassionate, but she also wants to come off as being high class. So she knows a little bit of French and she kind of flaunts that a little bit. Alright, so the nun is a little weird because she isn't really described, but she does end up telling a story about a saint. So this might be one of those, so I'm going to go back and fill in the details and just never got the chance to. So a monk would usually live in a monastery. So basically all the nuns live in a monastery and all the monks live in a monastery. Both of these sets of people were supposed to devote themselves to prayer, doing good works, but this guy's a little different. He is loud and he wanders around in hunting attire because that is his favorite pastime. So a little less prayer and a little more hunting. The monks were supposed to stay at monasteries, but friars were the ones who wandered around. They weren't the most popular in Chaucer's time, probably for the same reason that Chaucer makes them unpopular. Um, in the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer makes it clear that this guy likes to take bribes to administer the sacraments, which obviously that's not a very Christian thing to do. Okay, so summoners were really not popular people. It was basically their job to summon people accused of blasphemy or heresy to come and stand before the church's court. Kind of makes the Spanish Inquisition, where people were arrested and then tortured until they confessed. This particular summer was also lecherous, which means he was probably a sexual predator. He's also scarred by leprosy, which is a disease that causes bumps and lesions on your skin and is highly contagious. This particular guy also likes to spout some Latin every now and again to sound important and educated, but like most people who spout big words they don't actually know, it doesn't help his cause at all. 
like the seminar, partner isn't too terribly popular either. This guy goes around and basically allows you to wipe your soul slate clean for a nice little contribution to the church. Basically, he helps you buy your way into heaven. He also got a side hustle going on where he sells fake relics like the bones of otherwise known as chicken bones. And the way he's described is having no beard and yellow hair, which doesn't really mean it to us. But in Chaucer's time, that was actually a sign that this guy could not be trusted. So the parson here is actually a complete 180 from the summoner and the part. He's super devout and practices what he preaches. So he's actually like a really good example of what Christianity should be. Now the nun's priest is also actually not really described much here, but he does tell a tale that suggests that he is a very, very witty man. Now we have moved into the middle class and we'll start with the merchant who obviously sells things. This guy sells furs and cloth, which during that time period would have very lucrative business. Then we have the cleric, who is basically your starving college student. He's studying philosophy and spends all of his money on books, so his outfit is literally almost falling apart because it's so worn out. He also doesn't speak much. When he does, it is obvious that he is very wise and also full of virtue. Then we have the lawyer, and basically it's not a lot different than being a lawyer today. He's commissioned by the king and he knows every law in England by heart. So Franklin actually means free man in Chaucer's time, and he's kind of in a weird place where he's in nobility, but he also doesn't work for the nobility. This guy, however, does really like food and wine and always has his table ready for a feast. So the physician is obviously a doctor. And this one is actually super good at what he does and is in great shape physically. But the narrator thinks he may be a little too preyed with money to be in spiritual good shape. All right, so this guy manages a manor. So if you've ever seen like Downton Abbey or some show like that, there's this one guy who's in charge of everything that happens in the house. He hires people, fires people, makes sure that everything's within budget. Um, However, being in charge of finances makes it very easy for this reeve to embezzle some money his master, and his master remains none the wiser about it. At first, Bath is a town on the river Avon, and not the last name of her latest husband. Technically, she's a seamstress, but she really just kind of makes her money by marrying people. She's been married five times and boasts about her numerous affairs that she had in her youth. She isn't the quiet, demure lady of the court that we would kind of expect from this time period. She's loud, she likes nice clothes, and she enjoys a good argument. She's also described as being deaf in one ear, but then she also has a gap between her teeth. And in Chaucer's time, that gap was considered very attractive. Now we are into the trade class and basically the five guys who are known as the guildsmen. So this is kind of like a fraternity for tradespeople. If you think about it, it totally makes sense. You get a group of guys who do similar work and then you've got a way better bargaining power when you're trying to sell your wares to nobility or to the middle class like the merchant who's trying to sell your stuff. So this group encompasses the haberdasher, the carpenter, the weaver, the dyer, and the tapestry maker. So this guy, the haberdasher, is a guy who sells men's clothing, as well as little sewing things like buttons. The carpenter would be the guy who would build housing, ships, frames, things like that. A weaver would basically take material like wool, put it on a loom, and then weave it all together to make a fabric. The dyer would then take the fabric that the weaver has made and dye it into whatever colors that they needed to make an outfit. The tapestry maker would make tapestries, which are kind of like paintings made out of weaving. So if you look at these five guys that are the guildsmen together, 
it kind of makes sense why they're in the same group. Surprise, the cook is a cook. He works for the guildsman and he's not really talked about all that much, except he taught the really gross, crusty sore on his leg, which I don't know about you, but I would not want in a cook. Then we have the Mansiple, and this guy is pretty much the supply guy. He gets whatever a college or a court needs for him to function. This guy particularly works for lawyers. This guy is lower than the people he serves, but he's actually super smart and much smarter than a lot of them. So we are down to the final class, and these guys, like I said, are kind of the unskilled laborers of the group. So the yeoman is a servant, and it's his job to make sure the knight and the squire have all of the stuff that they need. So the shipman is a sailor, and his skin is kind of weathered. See, for noble, then you didn't have to go outside. And when you did, you were usually in a carriage or had umbrellas, things like that. So your skin would remain fairly pale. But if you worked outside, you'd be tan. That would be kind of a giveaway that you were from a lower class who had to work outside. This particular guy is a bit mischievous and likes to steep wine from his captain when his captain is sleeping. So basically, this guy's a farmer. And you remember the parson back from up in the clergy class? Well, this guy is his brother. And like his brother, the plowman is a good Christian, good heart, who works hard and pays his tithes to the church. So a miller basically just grinds grain into flour. This guy's a big mouth, literally and figuratively, and a wart on his nose. And he's not very content with where his place in the hierarchy is. So much so that he drunkenly demands to tell the second tale, which not only is out of order in class, but the tale itself is blasphemous and makes fun of everyone above him in station, including women. Finally, we got to the host, Harry Bailey. His job is basically to facilitate the tales and keep the pilgrims from fighting one another. His title host could actually mean that he's an innkeeper, or Chaucer could be playing on the word to suggest like the heavenly host. Since they're on a pilgrimage and this guy seems to be in charge of the journey, that could make sense. Unfortunately, since the story is unfinished, we'll never actually know what Chaucer's true intentions were. So those are the pilgrims who are on this journey and are going to Canterbury to show how religious they are by leaving offerings of gold and silver at the shrine of St. Thomas Becket. After having heard about these pilgrims, perhaps you can deduce whether they were really religious or just really wanted people to think that they were. So that might also have been one of the themes that Chaucer was exploring through the Canterbury Tales.